welcome to everyone attending this webinar. Um, my name is Matthew Dixon. I am the Director of Fashion and Luxury at the MBS Group. Uh, as a brief description, I'm a white man in my 40s with closely shaved brown hair. Um, the MBS Group specialises in executive search across all consumer sectors, including fashion, beauty, retail, FMCG and hospitality and wellness. Um, helping our clients drive better d &I strategies through their hiring policies um, is front and centre to the work we do. And today's uh, webinar will discuss diversity and inclusion in the fashion industry um, and really based around a report that we released in the summer in partnership with the British Fashion Council. So before I share some data and, and results from the report, um, I'd like to introduce the panel. So, um, Jamie, if I could uh, just ask you to, to introduce yourself and give a brief description of yourself uh, for, for our audience. Thanks, Matthew. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jamie Gill. I'm um, a South Asian male in my 30s with uh, short black hair. And uh, yeah, I am the chair of the Diversity and Inclusion Committee at the British Fashion Council. I also sit at the, sit on our executive board at the BFC. Um, I have uh, recently founded uh, a new initiative called The Outsider's uh, Perspective, which aims to bring um, people of colour into the business of fashion. And I am um, a CEO turned executive director of uh, Roxander. Thank you so much. Uh, and Jeffrey, if you could introduce yourself to us. So good morning, everybody. My name is Jeffrey Williams. Um, my description is I am a black man in my 40s with no hair because it's fallen out. Um, and I am the VP of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Burberry, um, which means that I work on our strategy across what we do with our consumers, with our employee base, but also, I guess, how we kind of look to the future around this work as well. So really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Greatly appreciated and welcome. Um, Sinead, lovely to have you here. If you could uh, introduce yourself. Thank you, Matthew. And what a great panel to be on. I am a, a white cisgender queer woman who uses the pronouns she and her. I have brown shoulder length hair. Today, I am wearing a silk shirt that has black polka dots and a floral print. And I identify as physically disabled. I am the CEO of Tilting the Lens, which is an accessibility consultancy that works with organizations large and small to support them in their strategic development of accessibility across people, places, product and promotions. And really in the fashion industry and beyond, we support our clients to move from awareness to action to create systemic change within this space. Thank you so much. Uh, and Roberta, it'd be lovely to hear from you everyone and uh, great being here and uh, wonderful thanks for the invitation i am a white woman on my late 30s uh, uh, mid length uh, fair hair and quite small as a uh, as my uh, stature as well uh, i am uh, originally from italy but i have been living uh, for more than 15 years, in fact, abroad. I've been living in Berlin, in London, and uh, most uh, lately here in Copenhagen, where I've been spending the past six years of my life. I'm uh, heading up HR and people team at uh, Gunny. I've uh, previously worked across uh, different industries, uh, so I'm kind of industry um, agnostic. So I've been working in retail, FNCG, pharmaceutical, and a broad spectrum of industries, which is what I like as uh, you know not being focused on one specific industry but really bringing the the the, the people uh, toolbox at the core of a business and at the table of the decision which is what i'm doing here at Ghana when i joined uh, last year to set up a whole uh, hr and uh, new people team and including also leading the important work around the diversity and inclusion which is uh, relatively new i would say at Ghana, uh but is definitely at the focus of everything that we are doing so looking forward to sharing with you all more about that as well during the webinar fantastic thank you and and finally live from a hotel room in vancouver we've got gus busman thanks matthew and hi everyone what a privilege to be sharing the space with you today uh as matthew mentioned i'm currently in vancouver so it's 3 a.m so i apologize for uh any implications of that but um I am a cisgender male in my 30s, short hair, thick glasses, and 
I am originally from Brazil, where I've always been Caucasian. And since moving to Europe five years ago, I am identified by others as a person of color, even though I feel like I experience all the privilege of uh, a white passing man. I think that's a very uh, telling and compelling history of how uh, there's so much more we need to do and the implications of that. Um, I lead uh, IDEA at Lululemon. So IDEA stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity in Action. And I lead these programs across Europe and the Middle East. Uh, transitioned to this industry about five years ago when I moved to London, but originally a lawyer, both in corporate law, human rights law, and uh, have a PhD in the perception of our identities and how we translate that conversation into the workplace. So that's me. Amazing. Well, I'd like to, to kick things off with uh, just to give our audience a flavour of uh, the report that we produced and that will be the, the basis of this conversation. So um, my colleague uh, Rosanna is going to share a screen and we can we can talk through that. So um, Rosanna, if you could just move to the next slide, that would be great. So um, 2020 was a turning point for the fashion industry. Uh, the death of George Floyd, the subsequent BOM movement, and the social effects of COVID-19 became catalysts for widespread commitment to change within the fashion industry. And with that in mind, uh, the MBS group decided to approach the BSC to discover whether this intention from the fashion industry was turned actually into an action. So we produced a report and it's a first of a kind piece of research into what diversity in the fashion industry truly looks like. Uh, it was drawn from data from more than 100 conversations with fashion businesses operating in Europe, um, plus in-depth conversations with chairs, CEOs and HRDs across all market levels. And this report measures progress on DNI across the fashion industry through gender, ethnicity, LGBTQ+, social mobility and disability. And there is still a significant reluctance within the industry to discuss DNI, actually, despite many positive initiatives being launched. So that's something that we'll discuss today. If you could maybe move to the next slide, please. To begin with, I actually want to look at the business case for better diversity. Um, we've sort of, we've seen that companies with really strong DNI initiatives and really strong uh, DNI engagement within their customers and uh, employees drive better outcomes for their customers. They deliver biz better business returns. It the, the diversity of thought uh, promotes greater innovation and new ideas. It greatly improves reputation of the brand with a greater attractiveness to employees, which in a market where uh, post COVID companies are struggling to employ uh, talent is, is, is highly, highly important. And diversity should therefore be treated as a business critical issue and prioritised in the same way as other areas of business modernisation, such as uh, sustainability and digital transformation. Move to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you uh, some uh, comparisons. So as a business, uh, as I mentioned, the MBS group work across many different consumer facing sectors. And we've already uh, produced reports like this for retail, for hospitality, uh, within consumer goods and groceries and within, uh, within health as well. And we wanted to compare how fashion stacks up against those industries. Immediately, if we just look at the percentages of businesses in the fashion industry that have a coordinated DNI strategy, you can see from that graphic, it already falls behind other areas, you know, grocery and consumer, 77% of businesses have it, uh, retail, 79%. And yet fashion at this point in time, when the uh, uh, report was produced, only 51% of businesses had a structured DNI strategy. Now, encouragingly, a further 21% of the people we spoke to were in the process of actually putting that strategy together. And when we start to measure this again in 2023, in the next report we'll produce, we're really looking to see uh, some significant movement forward on that. If we can move forward, please. Likewise, despite an industry being uh, largely, if you think of a fashion industry, the, the highest percentage of customers are women. And yet, actually, when you 
look into uh, the roles across board, across executive committee, um, and at uh, the next uh, layer down. So the senior leadership of fashion brands, you can see how heavily dominated they are by men. So there's this disparity where, you know, women buy the highest proportion of product and yet are simply not being represented on the board. We can move forward, please. And likewise, uh, F, um, progress is slow on ethnic diversity as well. So against the backdrop of the 2020 Black Lives Matter movement, many fashion brands really promised to double down and renew their focus on ethnic diversity. And while our research has found evidence of a lot of initiatives designed to increase uh, minority representation, the effects of these have yet to be felt in senior roles. So again, if we look across board, we look across executive committee in the next layer down, uh, you know, we're, we're not even at 10%, you know, let alone 20%. So it's still incredibly uh, challenged in this space. We can move forward. And then if we move beyond gender and ethnicity, um, we can look across the LGBTQ plus community. So uh, one area where the fashion industry does score positively is in this space. Our analysis of the industry found that fashion is still an inclusive or is an inclusive space for LGBTQ plus colleagues. And well over half, so that's 62% of businesses we spoke to, have an LGBTQ plus leader in the top two levels of their organization, which is in, um, incredibly encouraging. However, by contrast, disability remains a woefully underdeveloped area. Only 7% of businesses reported to have a disabled leader in those areas. Now, it is an area where um, that's becoming harder to measure because of uh, data laws, but also um, the general uh, stigma of, of, of uh, uh, leaders, you know, not wanting to necessarily disclose uh, a disability and maybe sort of past prejudices which have uh, prevented a disabled leader from having the same business opportunities going forward. But it's an area that, you know, 7% is, is a pretty tough figure to take. And by prioritizing social mobility, uh, this presents a really exciting opportunity for the industry. The most advanced businesses from a DNI perspective were placing social mobility at the heart of their DNI strategy. And we'll talk a little bit about that later about you know, grassroots level, you know, barriers of entry into the industry as well. So if we could move forward, please. And then looking ahead. Um, so this report, Diversity and Inclusion in the Fashion Industry, was, was launched in June this year. Um, we're about to start the research on the second edition, which will start to measure against these set of figures to see how things have changed. But today, uh, the panel and I are going to discuss uh, the findings of this report and you know, share some of their own stories, initiatives and strategies uh, to enable other companies to benefit. And then if we can... Wonderful. Um, so let's begin. Um, and Jeffrey, I'd, I'd, I'd like to put this first question to you. Um, I'd really like you to, you know, Burberry from the report we, we did was uh, a business that ahead of most was driving a really strong diversity agenda. Within your top three layers of leadership, you had better DNI than, than most. So I'd like to ask how do you develop that across uh, multiple territories? But also, given the scale of Burberry, um, how have you developed DNI strategies that cut through at uh, a really significant scale on a global level? Cool. So I think there's a, a number of things that we've done. Um, you know, I've worked in diversity and inclusion across many sectors now for, gosh, about the last 12 years. And I think what we had the opportunity to do at Burberry when Erica Bourne, our chief people officer joint, was she's one opportunity for us to kind of lay a stake in the ground of what we want to stand for in this conversation. So we kind of really lent into getting our leaders to understand their role, their need to commit to drive this forward because it doesn't happen with just having a DNI function. It happens when everybody decides that they are equally engaged and can see the value for themselves in this work. Um, and then we also spoke to our people. So we were able to take you know, do focus groups and really kind of reach out into the organization to understand what people were expecting from us region by region. 
And I think our strategy was then born out of that narrative of actually, if our colleagues in Asia are saying that what we want to focus on is accessibility, that's where they put their energy. It's not coming from my team and us saying, well, actually, everybody's going to do X. It was really them kind of defining and looking at creating their own working groups. I think in the report, you know, you talk to the fact that we have about 12 working groups that go across each different business unit that we have within our organization. All of them have, you know, three DNI objectives that they're working on. They are directed to the business, but also back to my team and the overarching mission that we're going on. But I do think it's also been very much about that piece of how have we as the DNI team told a story of the power and benefit of DNI. So before we everyone else joined, I was talking about the conference that we hosted yesterday, which was a global conference for all of our director plus audience, where we were talking about a number of things. So why is diversity and inclusion important to a creative business? How do we achieve gender balance? And what are the things that we need to consider when we think about it from an intersectional and representative um, standpoint? And how do we, again, get our leaders to be like, actually, this is my journey. This is my bit moment to learn. This is my moment to reflect. So we kind of went through this day. And at the end of it, we spoke about this thing called continuous improvement. A lot of time when we talk about the subjects of diversity, everyone assumes that we need to get to a point of completion or tick uh, you know, within a time frame. This is an evolving subject. You know, this is a conversation that as a society we've been having for the last 200 years. So as we continue, it's that piece of we keep, need to keep moving forward. And it's a, and it's a journey it's a, and it's a moment. And it's those things of actually let's celebrate this win, but let's continue to look into the next. So I think that's kind of how we've approached it. And it's been very organic, uh, but very much leadership led with input from all of our people. Thank you. And um, Gus, I guess you know, again, working for a, another business that has, uh, you know, real complexities across uh, territories. Do you have a, a similar um, point of view of that? Do you, do you uh, does uh, uh, Lululemon have a similar sort of ability to work across different areas? Thanks, Michael. And thanks, Jeffrey. It's so interesting to hear your perspective on that. And I think, Lululemon, we are a well-being company and uh, we try to focus in elevating the human potential by helping people feel their best. So that is a conversation that we bring into our business and try to understand what does it mean to feel your best? Uh, how do we represent different communities and what does it mean to uh, the sentiment of belonging across these different geographies and territories? And in our culture statement, we also say that we are a team of committed people who care deeply for each other and believe anything is possible, relentlessly pursuing our growth together. So that uh, is the core of what we do. And the team of IDEA started um, our work as it is now after repurposing and reviewing all our practices uh, in 2020 with 17 members and currently we grew up to 28. So what we do is partner with leaders across all layers of the business to identify how can we infuse idea in everything we do. So as an example, I partner with our um, all our directors in Europe and we sit once a month to review uh, a report where we collect information from all different regions in EMEA, what are the themes that are coming up for them in terms of needs, but also what are the wins? So we can replicate the wins, tailor a new ones to other markets. And with that, uh, we have up to our executive vice president sitting with uh, our idea team once a month, committing to action in the next four weeks and coming back with uh, a report of what they've done. So we truly believe that this commitment is across all layers of the business. Amazing, thank you. Um, Roberta, one of the, the, the sort of interviews that really stood out for me in the, um, when we were talking to you um, was, Andrea and, and yourself, there seems to be an absolute commitment to DNI and sustainability from the very, very top at Gani. It felt, you know, inbuilt into the sort of fabric of the business. And um, whereas maybe some other companies I spoke to had, had sort of almost bolted the DNI piece on, it just felt intrinsic to the to the Gani brand. Um, 
could you sort of explain how you how you sort of built that together and how you um you know sort of really put it as a, as a sort of core value because it's it's proven that businesses that had a complete buy-in from the CEO down, you know, deliver better DNI strategies, that it's not just an HR issue. So tell me about that partnership with 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 you, with your CEO. Yeah, thank you, Matthew, uh, for for the question, actually. And uh, yeah, it's um, it's very interesting. And I guess you yeah, completely, you know, share, uh, you know, the same, a little bit the same, the, the same opinion, in fact, that my colleagues have just uh, shared in saying that uh, diversity and inclusion, and in fact, uh, at Ghani as well, the whole responsibility, sustainability agenda is not a standalone business. We truly believe that at uh, at uh, at Ghani, it's the fundamental core core principle and as I said at the beginning we are very at the beginning of the diversity and inclusion agenda so for us it was really really important to make sure that uh, all of our values the DNA the core values of the company was embedded across all layers of the organization so when I joined Gandhi last year with the key mandate to basically bring the people agenda uh, in the uh, in the management team, in the leadership team, and uh, you know taking this seriously. So we are basically shifting the HR approach from being a function, uh, an administrative function to a core business, a strategic partner. We start uh, revisiting all of our core values. So we had a um, a wonderful workshop actually with lots of people within the business, a core member of the leadership team, key stakeholders, uh, two days together with very intense conversation, lots of posted on the walls, but in essence, in a very, in a very simple way, I must say, uh, we, we drafted our new revised set of values, which are now five, which are responsibility, openness, uh, optimism, uh, authenticity and accountability. And then linked to that, we've also drafted a set of new policies, uh, which are defining the way in which we do things at Ghana. We will call it now the Ghana way. But if we think about those values, the, the, the diversity and inclusion element is definitely embedded in everything that we are speaking about, because responsibility is basically, you know, it's being responsible and taking this uh, very seriously. Openness, uh, yes, we want to openly talk about that. Optimism, yes, it's hard, so we are definitely honest, not perfect, but we are taking this seriously and, you know, we are doing the best we can to take small steps often in the right direction. Authenticity, allowing everyone here in the organization to be the best version of themselves and accountability. As I said also before, doing the things, uh, taking the things uh, very seriously, and uh, you just make things, uh, making the things uh, happen, recognizing also the the difficulties behind. And then we 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 keep uh, talking about those uh, core five values across everything that we do. Basically, I've introduced. Um, the model of the business partnering. So we uh, revised completely the, the, the recruitment processes as well, where definitely we, we have a much more subjective approach in the way in which we hire our people. So something that I always say to my people managers out there and to my stakeholders, we don't recruit anymore based on company culture, but on skills and organizational fit. We launched a new onboarding program. Values almost. Yeah. Exactly, making sure that our 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 people, everyone who's joining Ghana, is sharing the same values and the shared philosophy here at uh, at Ghana. We launched a new onboarding program to keep strengthening the, the the sense of belonging of our people in the company. We brought those values into the personal development plan and the appraisal conversations. So somehow. We try to measure them, despite uh, I completely uh, uh, recognize how hard it is uh, to measure the the impact of values and you know give a core KPIs uh, to a whole behavioral and value conversation. But at least bringing the value conversation into appraisal conversation and development plan is definitely the first step. And we'd introduced, we have started to introduce a set of policies that definitely uh, strengthen the sense of uh, um, inclusivity within the company, such as uh, supporting breastfeeding mothers at work, uh, introducing sabbatical leave, activism and volunteering the policy, right to vote, flexible policy, uh, and then most lately providing financial support to our US employees or overall, actually, all of our employees who have to reach another country 
to basically undergo uh, abortion surgery or any visit in fact uh, connected to that in response uh, to the latest the raw wave. Uh, so we're very um, conscious of uh, tackling diversity also doing everything that we can uh, to drive a more and more inclusivity. Uh, that's the first uh, that that's that's for us at the core of everything that we're doing uh, here at, um, at, uh, at GAMI and we're incredibly proud also to share with everyone that we're very keen uh, to maintain uh, uh, the gender split high in the leadership agenda here at Ghani, in uh, within the extended uh, management team, 67% of us are, is a percentage of uh, female in leadership position, and that goes uh, higher uh, as we move into the group of our executive uh, committee. So at the moment, our gender split is uh, one of the things that we are particularly focused uh, here at, um, at Ghani. But the partnership, as you said before, Matthew, with CEO and the whole leadership and stakeholders is absolutely fundamental and it's definitely a, a not an HR tick box exercise at all so encouraging dialogue with everyone in the business is always always at the um, at the core of everything we do and it just really comes across I mean you know it was one of the most enjoyable conversations I had with with, with Andrea and yourself because it it was just a natural conversation you know the uh, it didn't feel like you were was sort of nervous about what you may or may not say. It was just this is the way we operate, and it just felt ingrained in the business. And and that was you know I just remember it being such a powerful conversation. So thank you, uh, Matthew. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, honest, not perfect is one of our mantra here at Gunny. Uh, and it's also very much uh, connected uh, to authenticity. Yes, it's hard. Uh, yes, uh, we are at the very beginning. Uh, yes, we do this uh, seriously. And I think that uh, one of the key steps uh, to embed diversity and inclusivity, not just at Ghana, but globally within the fashion industry is to openly talk about that. Uh, so we are, we are ready for it, despite we know there is a lot of a still stigma and fear within the, uh, within on, about uh, these, uh, these uh, topics for sure. Thank you. And um, Sinead, if I come to you, I mean, I guess one of the, the, the most shocking statistics of, of this report was the fact that only 7% of, of uh, leaders in the top three layers of, uh, of the businesses we interviewed um, disclosed any form of, of disability. And I remember a previous conversation I'd had with you where you talked around, um, you know, employing disabled leaders as a uh, an opportunity and an investment, not a not a cost to the business. And um, I mean, just give me a view on, on 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 the statistics, but also just talk further about the impact of of not including disabled people around the board boardroom table. I think one of the great takeaways from the report that was created was focusing not just on recruitment, but focusing on culture. For me, looking at that statistic of the fact that seven percent of leaders within fashion organizations identify as disabled interrogates lots of how we think about ableism and disability in society. In your introduction, you talked about how perhaps the reality of this 7% is because due to GDPR, due to data collection legislation that differs across country and across region, these are not accurate statistics. But for me, it asks further questions around the culture of society at large and those within fashion organizations. I think it's fair to say that as a society, we have long held the view of disability being less. To give you a couple of examples, you know, if a parent becomes pregnant, somebody may ask the question around the gender of that baby, which is an outdated question now that we know that gender is a spectrum and not a binary. But often that adult will say, I don't mind which gender it is once they're healthy. Mm. What we mean by that is not disabled. Now, I don't believe that every adult or parent is going about the world hoping to not have a disabled child, but it is a script that we have inherited as a society. Also, if we think about innovations that are happening within the fashion system, you know, it has taken us so long to get visibility of those particularly who are physically disabled within the fashion system, even from a marketing perspective. So how do we ask leaders to feel a sense of pride, courage, and confidence in identifying as a disabled leader? Richard Branson has done some great work in this space, talking about his experiences of being dyslexic and how dyslexic thinking as a methodology has made him a successful leader. Right. Now, 
Richard hasn't taken the next step and linked dyslexia to disability, which also in itself is interesting because he looks at dyslexia as something that is other to disability. And again, how is that also informed by the ableism that exists within society? But that lack of representation of disability at senior levels within the organization is really indicative of the slow rate of progress that we have had. And to your point, not looking at this work as an investment, but as a cost. Let's acknowledge for a second that in many of the countries in which fashion capitals exist, there is legislation that requires brands to ensure that they have a minimum recruitment of disabled people within their organizations. Many of those brands are not meeting those minimum requirements and instead are looking to the recruitment of disabled people as a cost and would rather pay those governments a fine because it is easier or more difficult to retain that talent than investing in new infrastructure. So thinking about the recruitment journey, at what point do you ask potential applicants if they have any accessibility accommodations? Is your job description accessible? Not just in terms of the PDF or the Word document, but are you asking for characteristics such as, is somebody a good communicator? What does that mean? In what language? Verbal? Written? Do they need to maintain eye contact in order to be able to fit within the company culture? I think so often as organizations, we say that we welcome people of difference, but do you explicitly invite them or do you place the expectation that they must code switch within your own culture and assimilate? But we also need to think about how we're designing places and spaces. So many fashion brands exist within cities and retail spaces that are protected in legislation because they are historic and cannot be made accessible. And even if we think about losing the spending power of the disabled customer of $1.7 trillion per annum, the reality is we are hindering ourselves in terms of who we can employ. How many store spaces in the US, for example, exist within a mall infrastructure? They are two story. And if you are a customer and want to go from ground floor to first floor, you have to exit the store, use the elevator in the mall, and then go up to the second floor. But that immediately says that you're not hiring anybody with a physical disability. That is not an opportunity for them. But as we think about this work, often when we think about disability or accessibility, we think about it from a place of compliance, not from an opportunity of creativity. The fashion industry is currently besotted with the metaverse. There are few conversations about how the metaverse is accessible whether that is in terms of avatar representation, audio description, but even the technology that is designed to be inclusive in this way. And there is some great work happening in the adaptive space, particularly from the startup model. But product alone can't be the solution because product ensures that disability exists only within the customer model, not within our colleagues, not within our executives. So this holistic strategy needs to be across people, places, product and promotions. We need to look at it within our retail environment, within our pop up spaces, within our corporate office development. More and more, we find people coming back to the office. But what we know from data this week is that the pandemic allowed more disabled people than ever to be employed. That is because the digital tools allow an accessibility that the physical environment does not. I'm so pleased that we have a British Sign Language interpreter joining us on this call and captions available to people who speak more than one language or find my accent difficult to interpret. The reality is creating spaces like this give greater access for people, but in our rush to return to normal, in our rush to emerge and focus only on the profit and loss of the business, particularly in a moment where we are possibly looking into a global recession, who do we now leave behind once again mm. that we first included almost by accident due to the pandemic being a mass disabling event? So why is there a need to look to this as an investment, not a cost? More than ever, as we look to budget shrinking within the recession, we need to hold firm on building the systemic change within this organization. I loved what Jeffrey said about this being continuous journey. This is an iterative process. So much of the reason why this work hasn't been happening in disability across organizations is due to that lack of representation. People don't even know what the word is that they should use. Is it differently abled? Is it special needs? Is it people with disabilities? Will I offend people? We haven't even got to the point of shared understanding of language and awareness and disability in many fashion organizations. To answer that question, I would say use identity first language, capitalize the D in disabled, and look at disability as something that's prideful and makes us who we are. But also to the point that Jeffrey was making about intersectionality. And as more corporate agendas become about gender one year, race the next, religion the other, then disability or social class, 
We only further marginalize those who are most on the margins if we continue to divide our populations by that segregation of identity. So ensuring that we have greater representation is so important, but this needs to not just be a movement, but a continuous movement, and also looking about pipeline of talent, access to education, and ensuring that we are promoting and retaining people rather than just bringing them through the door and not setting them up for success. One of the things that struck me when I think the very first conversation you and I had was uh, you talked about how the disabled community are natural problem solvers because they have to be, you know, in in, in whatever challenges they face on a day to day basis. And actually, when you think about the challenge of day to day business, that inherent ability to solve problems feels an incredibly strong um, sort of benefit or, or skill set to have which is often not mapped within a job description or is often not considered within an interview process or within an onboarding scheme. How do you, and Roberta was asking great questions about this, how do you match what skills people have based on a CV, whether it's hard skills or soft skills, with their identities and how the world shapes them? Disabled people are innovators by design because we live in worlds that were not designed for us. So how do you, while not othering people and asking those who are most marginalized to do work in your organization that those with the most privilege do not do, but how do you ensure that you're creating that pathway for people to be able to succeed and acknowledging as a team and particularly as a leadership team that those are vital skills. And that's where we need to move to a culture in an organization of not just asking people to disclose, but looking at self-identifying as a place of great pride. I do think there's a hesitancy here that we ask people to be their whole selves at work. People should be have a choice about how much of themselves they want to bring to work, rather than that being a demand or something that the organization needs, but that people feel psychologically safe to do so is what is vital and most important. And I think it is about fostering that culture so that we're not reliant on legislation or quantitative surveys that gives us that data about our workforce, but that as a culture, we are fostering places where people are safe to be their full selves. And um, that's wonderful. It actually sort of, you know, slips very nicely into what I was going to ask to, to, to Gus, that, that when we had the conversation about some of the initiatives and, and strategies around Lululemon, uh, uh, Lululemon, there seemed to be such an ability for your strategies to really, really engage both with your teams within the business, but externally with customers as well. And, and that, that word safety, so sort of, the safe space came up many, many times. How do you get your, your initiatives to cut through in such a, uh, a positive and, and deep way? Well, I think I really, as I mentioned before, being a well-being company, there's so much focus in allowing people to feel their best and at all times trying to understand what does it mean in different parts of society or for different identities or considering different needs of different people. So even when we start our recruitment process, it's all about culture ed. And we spend loads of time doing a mindset conversation and asking people, who is the face who is missing in your team? Who, who is the voice that you're not listening because your team is not diverse enough? And our educators and store managers are so committed to build that. And we are way ahead of where we expect it to be in our public goal of achieving 40% of uh, racial representation in our store teams. And building also, we expect to have 30% representation across all leadership which means uh, assistant store manager plus and director plus. So we expect really to hire these people and make them part of our business, but also allow them to progress. And at all times having conversation of what is needed and what, how can we remove barriers for equity? And one of the things I am most proud of is our people networks. So we have 12 people networks on the business and uh, we ex we look at them with a twofold approach. So we really expect them to create a space where people uh, with shared experiences can recognize each other and find safety in their community approach. But at the same time, we offer them the opportunity of co-creation. So we think of inclusive design and how we create products and services for these communities. So uh, 
we don't we don't only expect them to come and support but we will compensate them for that it was really important for us to remove the burden uh, of the underrepresented communities to educate and to create but also we create avenues where they can support and give the voice to what we do and a recent example which i was really proud to be part of is the lgbtq plus people network and back in october 21, we started the conversations about pride and we celebrate pride in uh, at least nine countries across Europe with Lululemon. And it was just important for us to understand what pride means in these different places. How can we celebrate that, but how it's a year long celebration and amplification of different voices. So we had one opportunity each Pride Month to amplify certain voices and to give it the image and the sentiment these people expected, but then how that continued throughout 365 uh, days a year. So we really said for you in the fight, with you in the moment. So the protagonism is not from the corporation, the corporate the protagonism is from these communities who are part of it, who are contributing to what we do, and ultimately driving positive change, not only inside our business, but in the communities we're in. Amazing. Thank you so much. And Jamie, just sort of switching to you. Um, obviously, you know, you've been part of the uh, the industry, but also, you know, stepping onto the, the, the diversity panel at the BFC, which you now chair. And um, could you just you know share some of the strategies that you're putting in place and I guess trying to sort of help British fashion uh, understand the importance of DNI, and particularly within maybe the fashion industry in the UK where there's lots of sort of smaller brands that are having to understand how they, they impl implement this at a, at a much smaller level as well. Yeah, no, sure. Thank, thanks, Matthew. I, I think just, just before answer, answering that, I just think it's, you know, listening to everything that everybody shared and thank you for pulling everybody together. I think, look, uh, what Lululemon, Ghani and, and Burberry are doing are fantastic exemplar you know, a uh, best practice in the industry and 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 something that I hope, you know, uh, the people are taking lessons from and really listening and can, can embed into their businesses. But, you know, the reality of what the data showed and everything Sinead's just said as well is we are so far from where we really need, we, we need to be like, and that's the bit that I think is, you know, my role and with the, with the British Fashion Council is just really bringing that to, you know, uh, reinstating the, the severity of the situation for a better word. And I think as Sinead, you were saying, yeah, it is culture. And it's not, you know, you, you were speaking on it from the disability lens, but it still obviously transcends into all the other pillars that we're, we're, we're speaking about, you know, like to not have a gender balance across, you know, European fashion uh, at executive board level all the way down for, a, you know, an industry that's predominantly cons consumed by women is just, it's just insane. And, you know, why, like, why, like we can, we can, we can bring our theories to the table and we, and we ultimately we, we, we know why, but, you know, that, that, that change on my side, I feel is, you know, it's 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 a twofold approach from what we need to do at the British Fashion Council, and I can and I'll speak to what what's being done. But I think you know to the plan with you know David Pencil now being our new chair, and and the way that we're going going to look and and and, and really get into the strategy for the whole British Fashion Council, but particularly speaking around DNI, you know we need to now be clear what is the vision you know uh, for 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 the industry and how how we're going to deliver that across all of the you know the the subgroups that make up DENI, uh, you know as as a collective but being clear and being transparent around that vision and, and and look to kind of you know announce that soon um and and how we'll get to that over over a duration because i still think as much as we can say you know it doesn't need to be within a time frame and we shouldn't have to activate you know in, in, a, in a business sense i think i think we do just to be practical and logical to actually instill change and i think in tandem with that is a um the, the the law piece you know I, th I think we really need to think about you know what what is the how, how does law feed into this to really just expedite it and I think it shouldn't be you know that way we can it's, it's speak of it from a, a social moral compass and think why why do we have to do this but this is the reality of instilling you know an expediting change and you think there's been and, and what I like to reference is you know the FCA have made it um mandatory now April 2022 you know for FTSE companies uh to really uh, 
uh, be clear on who what their board makeup is you know for that's for gender diversity and for ethnic uh, diversity not yet there on disability there's no mention on disability sit yet from the fca but a step in the direct the, the, the right direction uh small but 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 there and i think you know we've seen it with the sustainability act in america and we've seen it it's trickling through into europe and i think that's part of this role is to really really you know uh bring that to the forefront and and, and keep lobbying for that but but on on to your to your point matthew i think currently you know we have we have a business policy, you know, in under the uh, the DNI committee at the British Fashion Council, looking at strategies and methodologies for benchmarking DNI across the industry. And uh, you know, it's a big piece of work that really needs to fully be understood, you know, and 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 practical. I mean, you know, I'm about practicality about how we can do this and 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 being you know realistic with goals uh, with 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 where we are today and 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 the regulations around GDPR and where brands are sat. You know, with, with being so sensitive, you know, still around the around the issue and and the the lack of understanding still that we know completely sits you, you, you know matthew you pulled a great group together but how many people you know how many brands and businesses out there just don't know where to maneuver still and still could be you know even listening to something like this and still feeling kind of you know dumbfounded at the end of of this 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 area that i, I just don't get it i just don't understand it. it's, it's okay for us right now and then i think you know we have an education pillar as well of, of bringing um fashion opportunities into education particularly obviously in marginalized communities and and making sure that work is regional, you know, which is, I think, is a big part for the UK as well. A mentoring pillar that, you know, pairing talent with leaders that, you know, I think can be fleshed out a lot more. And then, of course, on our kind of kind of communications pillar as well, which I think, you know, is lacking far because, you know, we really need to kind of really be clear on, on, on where we are and where we're going for to before we get into the, the detail of uh, communicating. But I think, yeah, I think to your other point around, you know, what can smaller smaller businesses do? Uh, and, and I think it's... Um, my my advice on this and you speaking with the various different hats I, I I kind of wear as well is is I think smaller brands just need to be honest and realistic around their goal and their intent around DNI and you know if this isn't a priority for their business then they need to understand I think the long term consequences of this not being a priority and I think you know it kind of ends there or sits there it's like either you're going to grasp this or you're going to move with it or just kind of you know uh, leave it rather than you know a, a, a lukewarm kind of uh, a reaction or a approach to it or kind of struggling with it and I think and, and in, the, in the same time speaking speaking to those brands I think you know who the, and those businesses who don't fully understand the importance of uh of DNI then be be on it be honest about that and and seek help don't be you know don't be embarrassed about that seek help you know speak to Sinead speak to Tilting the Lens speak to speak to uh Daniel Peters organization fashion minority report you know there are there are consultants out there just going to have that conversation around Frank we don't we don't know what we're doing we don't understand we don't know how to kind of implement this at a, at a smaller level um and then I think my 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 last bit is you know lastly but no means kind of least is um if brands are struggling to source diverse talent because you know uh, the CV doesn't fit the existing prerequisite, then uh, literally just think outside of the box, you know, when hiring talent and, uh, and their approach to hiring and for those kind of smaller brands. And I think take a calculated risk on transferable skill set and be creative, you know, with, with, with hiring in, in, in this manner. And I think, you know, that's that's always worked for me. And that was mm. the well, that, that, that's a really interesting point, because um, and I'll sort of throw this open to the group, but um, social mobility felt uh, a huge opportunity for the industry and one that doesn't feel like it's being utilised in the right way. Um, you know, if we look at the set of statistics that are, this report's created, um, it feels it's a product of, you know, the, the barriers to entry to the fashion industry in the first place, which are, you know, largely around uh, students going to a fashion university, um, coming to a major city of the world to do an unpaid internship, and and then those who've got the best internships are are entering the industry. But even at that point, it, you know, that's a funneling process that eliminate many people who maybe can't afford to work for nothing or, you know, can't afford even to, to go to university in the first place. So I'd, I'd love to hear some of the, uh, the group's, you know, thoughts around how do you grow uh, talent at a grassroots level and, and give them the opportunity to progress um, if they haven't come up through the, you know, the, the sort of, if you like, the sort of standard routes that, that the industry has demanded over the last 30 years. I can maybe give you some inputs here, Matthew, maybe from an HR uh, perspective uh, here, Agani. Um, 
I would say what we did as soon as I joined, uh, you know, here Camilla Sir was uh, to remove unpaid uh, internship. Uh, that was definitely quite clear, which is a common practice uh, that, uh, you know, in the fashion industry, um, some unpaid internship in the past were also going on here at Gami as well. We received quite harsh comments as well on social media from, um, you know, in, in the past as well. So basically, you know, going back to data, yes, GDPR is not helping us, but we are trying to do everything that we can to use alternative tools to release into our employees and our customers as well. So to start with, we removed unpaid internship. Now, we're based in a country where I must say also the governmental support for students is also quite high compared to other countries. So the rule is that in Denmark, if you know, uh, uh, the, the, the students, for example, is meeting the criteria to receive a financial support from the government, we stay there. But if uh, that's not the case, uh, then Ghani will contribute and basically pay, uh, pay the same amount of money. So we are definitely trying to do everything that we can do to support uh, people approaching Ghani now with, um, with, uh, with an internship uh, for sure. And the second aspect is also time, which I think people managers need to be uh, very, very clear the need to allocate the right amount of time to train, educate, nurture talent within the organization. Most often within the fashion industry, uh, students are hired uh, to supplement lack of resources. So, so we ask uh, students to do a great amount of work, so sometimes also above uh, their skill set as well. And uh, people managers are just uh, taking for granted uh, a certain skill set and they just don't allocate the right amount of time uh, to really sit down with them and to really make sure that uh, you know, they are supported in the right way. So for me, the investment is not just a financial, but also it's in terms of time that we need to invest in those great, great young talent, uh, talent out there as well. And I think organization needs to do much more within internal mobility. I mean, we are again at the very beginning here at Ghani, but I would love to build an HR organization where we're moving resources from one country to another, from run, one region to another, exactly as Jamie say, make the most of those uh, so important transferable skills. So look beyond uh, a job description, look beyond uh, uh, the specific criteria for the job, but really try to understand exactly who you have in front of you. It implies, of course, to, to have the right, uh, not just external, but also internal recruitment practices as well, and really invest the right amount of time and build uh, internal mobility, internal talent mapping, internal succession planning, understand the critical roles. Uh, so that's uh, it's definitely uh, uh, quite a great amount of work that needs to, to, to be done, but it's definitely uh, worth paid off for, for sure. Thank you. And um, Jamie, I know this is something quite close to your heart. Do you, do you want to share a little bit more about, you know, how you've addressed this? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can just share a little bit, and it, 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 it's a, it's a, it's um, um, a platform um, that I've uh, recently founded. Thank you to uh, Jeffrey uh, here on the call from Burberry. It's, it's called the Outsider's Perspective, and it's 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 an incubator platform that ultimately tries to uh, tries to it tries it tries to look at this uh, seriously and practically and, and immediately with with just looking at professional uh, people of color out there this is where it's, it's kind of targeted out there who are when in it, whatever uh, industry they're kind of working in and have uh, are five years kind of plus within their relevant career and have entered a space and and don't want to be in that space and ultimately always wanted to be in fashion and wanted to be in a creative sector and, and for social mobility reasons or cultural reasons we know picked a more safer vocation vocation to kind of ultimately keep their parents happy for a for a better a better way of looking at it and 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 now uh post pandemic or even more looking for something else and i think that's the the cohort of talent uh we're speaking to to basically transition them into the the business of fashion and uh, you know making it clear all the open roles that are available from merchandising uh, uh, sales, uh, supply chain, etc., digital marketing, PR, finance, uh, strategy, uh, and just giving them the tools, giving them the you know, giving them the resource that's kind of needed access to mentorship, but ultimately having the brands you know engaged with uh, with this. And 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 Gus from Lululemon has is supporting now as well. So it's uh, fantastic uh, to be able to bring you know uh, brands um, who who are taking this seriously to kind of look at this talent with uh, fresh eyes and fresh perspective. And I think the the, the theory behind it is that you know. Uh, 
this is this is smart people they haven't been in the industry they need to be brought up to speed on the nuances they need they need a bit of support here but in theory being brought into somewhere where they've always kind of really wanted to be and yes they're going to take six months longer than the traditional prerequisite of experience but they should be able to really excel and fly uh, and, and really make a difference kind of um long term so it's 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 an immediate approach to kind of you know, really scale the industry's um people of color metrics thank you um I'm aware we're, we're, we're sort of uh, getting close to time. So my, my final question, and, and I'll sort of go around the group, and, and Jeffrey, I'll start with you. But if I could ask you to, to the audience, maybe to, to offer, if you were speaking to brands or giving advice to brands on, on, on three things that will drive better DI and uh, strategies and initiatives, both internally and to customers, what, what would you recommend brands uh, focus on? I think brands need to focus on that they are selling their product to the world. A lot of the time we assume that we're selling to you, I know, the person closest to our store, but you're actually selling to every single individual that lives on this planet. And there is a need to have a clarity in how you speak to them, to understand their needs, but also to respect them as your consumers. So I think sometimes where we sit is we assume that, you know, because we are a, a luxury organization or because we've got a heritage of X amount of years that people are always going to come and shop with us. But people are changing and their needs are changing and their relationships with different communities are evolving and we need to be mindful of that. I think there's also an opportunity, we're talking about social mobility, and I think it's an opportunity of actually moving people from stores to head office, thinking about how we... Um, really get to understand our talent that work within our organization, but really understand the value of transferable skills. You know, I'm sitting in the role I'm sitting in today because a number of people saw that I had transferable skills. If they hadn't seen that, I probably would be doing something very different. So I think it's that piece of not just at senior levels where it's okay, you know, you've had 20 years of business experience, but if you've had five years experience, and that's why I think Burberry and myself are supporting Jamie on his project. And I think the final piece is you cannot do this in a siloed way. So you have to look at this intersectionally and you have to have those conversations with your organization to understand why you were doing it. Not just because Burberry have done X that you now need to follow the, the lead. You need to kind of find your authentic narrative behind this piece of work that you're going to be driving. And really, as I said at the start, understand your consumers. So if there's a need for you to reach out to different communities, make that process and do it. So I think it's that piece of really just kind of understanding why you're doing it, kind of making sure that you're utilizing all the skills and intelligence that's out there and then really being committed to this. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Gus, I'll throw this open to you. I'll try to be super quick, but one thing I find interesting as a DNI professional is that people often come to me and ask, can I make this joke? How do I address that? Can I still say that? And my response is always, I love that you think that my job is to police your humor, but there's so much more. So my advice is really to start thinking, how do we bring DNI conversation from this ethereal space and make it into something measurable? So what is your why and what is your measure? and how do you bring this to your strategy and with that involving every part of the business from leadership up into the entry level role and then be in conversation so what is the person who is not represented with intersectional lens how do we build these relationships bring them to your business uh, and we're very lucky to work with ambassadors in Lululemon and our ambassadors are currently 40% non-identifying as white, heterosexual, able-bodied. So uh, we try to be in relationship with them, listen to their needs. So our campaigns are with ambassadors, not with models. So it's not a transactional relationship. And with that, we bring meaning and we bring authenticity to these relationships and it informs everything we do. And I think that's a game changer. Fantastic, thank you. Sinead, what, what would you have to say on this? I think if I was to think about three things you know we're moving into the end of year where everybody is beginning to finalize if not already finalizing next year's budgets and even with a recession ahead I think accessibility should be a line item in every budget 
so often, whether we're thinking about retail infrastructure, that accessibility becomes impossible because it wasn't considered in the budget and it wasn't considered by design. So that allows us then to measure what we are spending on accessibility and whether or not we're prioritizing this work across different departments. That can be for training and HR, it can be for product design and innovation, it can be about investing into scholarships and funds for creating greater pipeline of talent. I think it's about empowering people to acknowledge that while this work absolutely requires sponsorship and resourcing from leadership, that the way in which we create a theory of change about this work is grassroots, grass top, and sideways. That this is everybody's opportunity and in many ways, obligation. And I think it's lastly, it's to look at legislation as a baseline standard and aim for better practices. So whether we're thinking around legislation for the minimum numbers that we need in terms of recruiting of disabled talent, or looking at the EU legislation that's coming down the tracks for digital accessibility for public bodies rather than private companies, but how does this industry take on that legislation and look to that as a starting point that they immediately accelerate from? And I think overall, empowering everybody in the organization to ask, is this accessible? Because that will move us from awareness to action. Thank you so much. Roberta, what about, um, what would you suggest? Well, uh, I'm sorry, you're probably getting the short straw, Jamie and well, Roberta. Yeah, no, no, it's very difficult to, to add anything else on top of what my great colleagues has mentioned, which is some wonderful end inputs, which I completely agree with every, every, everyone probably be bold because I think that the diversity and inclusion agenda within fashion industry and globally I would say it is literally under everyone's scrutiny in positive and in negative as well so be bold and accept a critique and listen to what your customers and to your um, to your employees as well and uh, accepting constructive feedback sometimes uh, is very very hard in hr we are amazing in saying uh, constructive feedback but when when they are giving them to us it always can come as a cold shower but i think that the power of listening to this is it's uh, it's amazing um there are many different um, ways of living lives out there and everyone needs to be respected. Um, so definitely respecting and uh, embedding feedback and try to make small steps often. It's uh, it's definitely the, the, the key for sure. Thank you. Thank you. And Jamie, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, look, no, everybody, everybody handles it. Uh, every, what everybody said was fantastic. And yeah, would echo, echo all of it. I think, you know, uh, just reiterating, you know, the, the, to the speaking to the smaller brands and speaking to the, to the non-believers so far, which I think is, 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 is where the message still needs to kind of, uh, land is, is be, be, be honest, be a really, be a really, re be realistic with uh, what you're trying to do with DNI here, and and what the intent is, and what you can deliver in your framework. And I think that that piece is is fine, you know, because it's a step in the right direction, you know, for now. Uh, but I think you know, just to to bring in this conversation, you know, is isn't going away. It's only going to get bigger. It's only going to get stronger. Uh, you know, as brands uh, realize the benefit and understand how it's how it's working for them, and more and more brands do. And as I mentioned, you know, with the the the, the government piece and the the lobbying piece, kind of. Coming into play as well you know it, it, it's going to become mandatory uh so i think you know act, act sooner uh both on uh, both on the business case as well as well as the social moral compass thank you so much well that that brings us to the end of this session um for those of you who who haven't seen the, the report we will be emailing a copy to everybody who who registered um and then a, a recording of this uh, webinar will be available on the BFC website uh, or YouTube channel, sorry, um, in the coming days. And I guess that just leaves me to thank Roberta, Sinead, Gus, Jamie, Jeffrey, and Vivi uh, for joining us. Um, and thank you for the BFC for their support uh, and my team internally at, at, at the MBS group. Um, and it's been a pleasure speaking with you all today. And uh, I wish you a, a great rest of the day. Thanks so much.